I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this two-day conference on the contribution of Walter Capps to the studies of religion. It's a pleasure to see uh, so many uh, friends, uh, alumni, students, at this uh, event, and also it's so nice to have uh, Representative Caps with us, Lois Caps. <laughs> this event has been in the planning for over a year, and I want to thank in particular uh, Richard Hecht and uh, Leonard Wallach for their, their work in putting this together. Also want to recognize Kelly Coleman, who's done a lot of the work as well in, in, in assisting this event. This particular event is uh, one of several uh, events that we have had this past year, and we'll have one more um, in this 10th year uh, remembrance and commemoration of Walter Capps since Walter died, it, it hardly seems that it's been 10 years since he left us, but indeed, that's, that's the way the calendar counts. But in this period, fortunately, the CAP Center has flourished. We were organized in 2002, and we have sought to carry forward Walter's legacy. Today, we have a strong and visible presence uh, at UCSB and in the city of Santa Barbara with 10 to 12 lectures downtown each year, an endowed course on ethics, interns in Washington and Sacramento, an endowed fellowship in ethics. UCTV carries our programs, many of them, and extends our exposure across California. And just this morning I was told that uh, across the entire United States now, and I also discovered this morning, talking to someone back here, that we're carried on iTunes. <laughs> so, great exposure in many different venues. Today's event would not be possible without the support from many CAP Center donors, as well as from support here on campus. I want to extend appreciation to the UCSB College of Letters and Science. Dean David Marshall has been extraordinarily helpful uh, with financially. The Department of Religious Studies, the Division of Humanities and Fine Arts, and the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, as well as the Office of the Chancellor. So we are uh, well supported on campus, and we extend our appreciation to, to all those units. At this point, I, I'm pleased to introduce Richard Heck, the conference coordinator. As I mentioned before, Richard has done so very much to carry forward in the planning. He's also done a lot beyond that to carry forward the legacy of Walter Capps, and especially through teaching the Vietnam course that Walter initiated and taught before Richard took the course over. So thank you, Richard, and now I turn the program over to you. Um, thank you, Clark, and um, I, I too would like to uh, join Clark uh, in thanking Leonard Wallach and uh, Kelly Coleman for their work. Um, I'd like to just uh, applaud you again a second time, the two of you. I, I hope that uh, during the next day and a half, we will learn more about Walter Capps' contributions to the study of religion. As many of you know, Walter was appointed to the then very new Department of Religious Studies here in 1964. He was appointed as its second faculty member. Um, this was only a year after the United States Supreme Court ruled in the famous Shemp case that religion could be studied in public universities, colleges, and schools without compromising our separation of church and state. That decision led to what I would like to think of as a second emancipation of the study of religion. That decision 
led to a renaissance of our discipline, which transformed almost every public and private university in the United States. Walter was among the giants who made us what we are today. At a time when it was most necessary, Walter clearly understood and made the case for the study of religion beyond and apart from the study of theology. From the very beginning of his career as scholar and teacher, Walter explored what our discipline was and what it could become. Our achievements as scholars of religion today are largely due to the vision of his generation and to him. Um, two weeks ago, we celebrated uh, the uh, Vietnam course by inviting uh, many of the students who had taken that course over 29 years back to the campus. And in that event, I noted um, that the greatness of a scholar is often marked by the quality of the scholar students. And I think this generation of people who are here have certainly distinguished Walter as well as themselves. Let me recognize, of course, David Chittister, who I think has come the greatest distance from South Africa, um, Ed Linenthal from Indiana, Jonathan Smith and Robert Orsi and Sarah Taylor from some place called Illinois, uh, Tomoko Masuzawa from Michigan, um, and Wendy Wright from Nebraska. Um, Giles Gunn and I just came from the third floor down below. <laughs> um, I too want to express uh, my gratitude to the faculty in religious studies for their participation and support of this conference. Um, I also would like to, to note uh, Roger Capps, uh, Walter's brother, who has been such a loyal supporter of everything that the Capps Center has done and his brother's memory. Um, I also want to recognize that there are some important people who are missing today. Um, I think of Robert Michelson, Tom O'Day, Bill Friedel, and Indian Smart. We note particularly the absence of Deborah Rose Sills, who worked with Walter in the Institute for the Study of Religion and the Robert M. Hutchins Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions here at UCSB before she became Professor of Religious Studies at California Lutheran University. She was the beloved wife of Giles Gunn, cherished friend of each of us here for so many years. And of course, she was a member of the Board of Directors. Later this spring, we will dedicate a bench in her memory in the courtyard of South Hall where we spent so many hours with her over many years. Thank you, Richard. For reasons that will become uh, obvious shortly, I hope, a number of people to thank. Congresswoman Lois Capps, Todd Capps, Laura Capps, Sharon Siegel, and a bunch of people in the office who let me use Lois's computer yesterday to frantically type up my comments uh, all, all afternoon. Uh, I didn't push any buttons, so I didn't think I sort of did any, any monkey business with any votes or anything, Lois. Uh, and, and, and then uh, uh, people in, in Lois's office in Washington, too, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing when there's an efficient office. I said to an email, uh, in an email to Lois, I said, boy, I wish, I wish I had at hand everything that Walter said on the floor of Congress. And three days later, uh, I got this folder with everything that Walter said on the floor of Congress. So there's some other things I'll talk with you about later, but, but thank, thank you and please pass on those thanks. I cherish this opportunity to think with all of you about the enduring legacies of Walter Capps. Uh, it's, it's a blessing to have been part of this community <clears throat> for so many years, a community that, uh, that has defined me 
uh, for the better, I hope, in, in so many ways. Uh, and we all know from the, the voices that are not here with us today how fragile life is and, and how much we need to cherish and squeeze out every moment of this opportunity to, to be together. What we say here now becomes part, of course, of active memory, for there are other benchmark anniversaries to come, and perhaps some of us will be uh, fortunate enough to, to be around for those. But it is always one generation or one community's conceit that those who follow will always pay attention. I hope that they will, that they'll build upon and reconceive and argue about our first take on Walter's extraordinary contributions to those at work in a subject field that he helped shape. In the fall of 1979, my wife Ula and I left for UCSB to go to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where we lived until moving to Bloomington three years ago, uh, uh, where I began my, my work at IU. During these years in Wisconsin, Walter invited me back a number of times to participate in one of his NEH seminars on de Tocqueville, to speak to students in the Vietnam course several times about the difficulty of memorializing other searing events, the Holocaust, the bomb, the terrorist attack in Oklahoma City, all like the war in Vietnam, uh, enduringly alive in so many toxic ways. Uh, during one of these visits, sometime after his unsuccessful bid for office in 1994, we were in his study, the Hermitage, and he told me that he was at work on a book about religion and politics seen through the prism of running for office. And I immediately started scanning various desks that were there, but any of you who remember the Hermitage know it was virtually impossible to find just one thing on any one of those desks, so I, I, I didn't see anything. Uh, well, after his successful campaign in 1996, I recall thinking this book could be delayed for a while, but I never forgot about it. When I received the invitation to participate in this conference, I asked Lois and Laura and Todd if they would help me learn more about this period of Walter's life that we only knew from afar. Students at Oshkosh, for example, were sometimes very confused around election times when they saw a Caps for Congress bumper sticker in my office. And I said, is this someone we should vote for? I, I haven't heard of him. Uh, and I always encouraged them to move to the district and vote early and often. You know, who knows? Well, specifically, I, I wanted to know if there was this manuscript and did it continue after the 96 election? Uh, could I read it? Were there other materials that would help me to get some sense of what led Walter to his decision to run for public office? and how he envisioned engaging what seemed on the surface, and really on the surface, a quite different set of challenges. Would his thoughtful and compelling voice be distinct in the cacophony of voices in Washington? Did his vocation as scholar and teacher prepare him, if it did, for this challenge? Yes, the Caps has told me, there are a few chapters of the manuscript, but the disk is corrupted and we can't get them all. There are a few other things on disk as well, and of course a 10-month record of Walter's statements on the floor, and then this huge treasure trove of stuff uh, from, from the campaigns, which I've only barely, barely scratched the surface of. So Laura sent me stuff as word attachments several months ago, uh, and I read some. I had more questions. I asked Lois if I could come to Santa Barbara a few days before the conference, and at least do some modest hunting and gathering among Walter's papers. Yes, said Lois, but they are still here in boxes and file cabinets. So this past Tuesday, I arrived and went to work. Now, normally, we all know about this, hunting and gathering is followed by a period of sorting and reading and thinking, and then more hunting and gathering, and so on. But not this week. There is, as you can imagine, a treasure trove of materials here. I had two and a half days to look through some of this stuff. There are proposals for books. For example, God and the Oval Office, Political Religion in the Reagan Era, subsequently retitled Chief Pastor, 
religion and the American presidency that extends the focus beyond President Reagan to Presidents Bush and Clinton, Vice President Gore, and one-time presidential candidate Jesse Jackson. This was a book proposal to the University Press of New England in 1993. There are several pages, specifically pages 105 to 106 and 353 to 355 of a manuscript about President Reagan's mobilization of conservative religious resources. But those are the only pages I could find. There are numerous videotapes from campaign events of all kinds. There are drawers filled with correspondence with the many, many people, breathtaking array of people that Walter was in contact with. There are drafts of editorial pieces for the LA Times, whether they were published or not, I haven't had time to find out. Mostly autopsies of the 1994 campaign and what Walter thought the meaning of the 1994 campaign was. More on that later. Uh, I found Walter's intellectual justification for his NEH seminars on the Tocqueville, and I really wanted to, to, to see these. Uh, one of them begins wonderfully, clearly, bluntly. The text is Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, and the subject is the status and function of religion within a democratic society. Reflecting on one of these seminars in 1986, Walter wrote that the participants, and these are his words, re uh, recreated and extended an ongoing conversation, very much like the inquiry that is reflected into Tocqueville's book. It was a conversation about what it means to be an American, what democracy asks of religion and religion of democracy, how the freedoms Americans enjoy are both sustained and thwarted, and the place and protections of individual initiative within a democratic collective order. There are so many wonderfully interesting documents. Walter Capps's manifesto, for example, written for staff members and associates as the campaign was being organized in the fall of 1995. <laughs> I only have time here to mention the categories the larger global setting, national and domestic issues, the moral and spiritual temper of our times, restoring a bond of political trust, the environment and individual and collective well-being, affirmative action, gender issues, and the status of other people, the primacy of education, attitudes toward representative government, and Walter Capps's personal ambition. Throughout, we hear clear, concise statements of conviction. Walter Capps urges mindfulness of the larger, meaning global here, framework, and cautions that the United States is currently experiencing a dangerous isolationist tendency, reflected in intense criticism of the United Nations. Walter Capps believes that the United States must exercise its global responsibilities in a cooperative, mutually supportive manner that is judicious, effective, and realistic. Walter Capps attests that life does not flow from ideology, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and that American imperialism is not the answer to the world needs. Walter Capps insists that the United States develop a more effective exchange with the Islamic peoples of the world. Walter Capps sides with those. Walter Capps applauds the effort. Walter Capps stands in sharp opposition to. Well, when I read this uh, statement about, about ideology, I, I remember seeing in, in some of the things I was going through so quickly uh, some really wonderful comments about that. So I dug through some more stuff and went back to this. This is. Uh, uh, a speech that Walter did in Uppsala, Sweden on the 50th anniversary of the United Nations called Human Rights, Spiritual Values, and Political Reality. And he addresses this issue of ideology uh, uh, beautifully. He's, he's responding now, he's, he's talked about the ideology of the right and its uh, uh, fierce attacks on, on the United Nations. <clears throat> and Walter says, you recognize, of course, that I am not on this side of things and that I stand very strongly for the alternative. 
Why? Because I've been trained, may I say it, by Scandinavian sensitivities, which are far more practical, far more benevolent, and far less cosmic in their writing of world history. I have been reading your periodicals and journals and come across article after article that calls attention to the rejections of histories of human experience <clears throat> that invoke the grand overarching theories. In this respect, I see the spirit of Vaclav Havel here, where the meaning of life is not to be deduced from ideological construction, but is to be found in the life world. I have learned much from some of your own teachers and professors about the preeminence of ordinary life philosophy, that is, about the very personal and practical ways in which life itself is engaged and respected. And these ways are so totally in contrast to the expectation that one can subscribe to an ideology, then use that ideology to discover life. Just a little more. He talks then about Doug Hammerskold and Walter's uh, tremendous respect for the book markings. <clears throat> but there is an additional testimony upon which one can draw. In this connection, he wrote, I have found myself drawn particularly to the writings of the great 19th century Danish theologian and hymn writer N.F.S. Grundtvig, who in a variety of ways advanced the dictum human first as a way of understanding oneself and the persons with which one is obliged to deal. Yes, Grundtvig knew that humans were also Danes and were also Lutherans and probably were also members of one or another political party and were representative of one or another ethnic identity. No matter, whenever a secondary characteristic was placed more prominently than the primary characteristic, that person was dehumanized to this extent. Not Danish, not Lutheran, but human, and then Danish, and then Lutheran, and so forth. Clearly, Walter often thought things through by typing them out. There are notes analyzing, for example, a speech at a congressional prayer, prayer breakfast by Newt Gingrich. Different formulations of his struggle, whether even to consider running for office. A quick and frank take on President Clinton's first 100 days in office, a typed prayer for a new day. And of course, there is so much about the unique expression of civic engagement Walter created through the Vietnam and Voices of the Stranger courses. Lest we think, however, that from the beginning, Walter could just bask in the golden glow that these courses brought him, I want to recall for you one of the few times I ever saw Walter discouraged and upset. He showed me, many, many years ago this was, and I, I wish I could have found this, uh, a letter from two senior members of the Religious Studies Department, strongly objecting to the Vietnam course. It was not scholarly. It was not appropriate for emotion and storytelling to be part of a course in a university. It was a deeply hurtful letter. In a short essay written in 1984, The Vietnam War and Cultural Memory, Walter informed readers, I became interested in studying the impact of the Vietnam War in 1977, when I was given some responsibility for programming within the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. He organized a conference titled The Impact of the Vietnam War Upon Liberal Ideology, during which Walter was very moved by the power of veteran story, the visceral power of that uh, testimony. I participated with Walter and several others from the department in a 1978 center conference titled The Vietnam War and American Values, at which Walter offered a paper for discussion, The War's Transformation. This may have been the first thing that he wrote ab about the war, but I'm not, I'm not sure about that. It's certainly one of the earliest. If you're interested, you can read this and the conversation that followed in the Center Magazine from July and August of 1978. It seems to me that from this point on, Walter's attention turned mainly, uh, not only to the complex legacies of the war, but what he and of course many others saw as the enduring deformations 
in American public and civic culture. Well before the boom in memory studies in many fields came Walter's book, The Unfinished War. In both of these courses, it seems to me, Walter was willing to live with and ask his students to be willing to live with the intellectually and emotionally draining realization that there are chronic afflictions that do not end. And yet he was steadfast in his belief that in his words, veterans who are leading the way out of this toward reconstruction, toward healing, itself uh, an interesting and complex word that's taken on so many political colorations. Veterans who are leading the way are pointing to some deeply abiding human truths that are encountered in regions lying far beyond worlds made accessible via political dialectics. He understood early the power of the witness, at that point an emerging sacred figure in the culture, who returned from extreme situations or conditions to offer testimony, contemporary sacred narratives. I am sorely tempted to divert from my chosen path here <clears throat> because there is so much to say about how we engage or avoid the chronic affliction. For example, insidiously transforming those impacted by violence into patients rather than witnesses, insisting that their stories be framed as illness narratives rather than impassioned testimony, the language of moral witness. There are important questions about the ownership and deployment of testimony and about a usually unstated assumption that suffering is by definition ennobling. But all that for another time. Was Walter's immersion in the impact of Vietnam the key or as seems more likely one of several keys in what seems to be his inexorable move into public worlds beyond the classroom? The role of religious studies outside the academy was certainly an issue of concern for a number of us, faculty and graduate students alike. One of the first challenges I recall that made a great impression on me, one that I still think about and, and actually still quote Richard from, from Richard Hecht, who wrote an essay called Religious Studies After the Holocaust. No academic discipline within the modern university, he wrote, can shield itself from the impact of history and historical events. Attempts to clearly separate what is done within the university context and what occurs in history around it are short-lived. All disciplines within the university are conditioned by history. This simple fact is even more powerful within those disciplines which self-consciously define themselves as having something to say to the historical understanding of man and to the human predicament at the end of the 20th century. <clears throat> we have not yet realized, Richard argued, the historical events of our century have either doomed our enterprise to antiquarian studies or have made what we are doing even more vital. Not long after Richard's essay appeared, Walter wrote an essay, Contemporary Sociopolitical Change and the Work of Religious Studies. It's in the CSR Bulletin sometime in 1981 that also branded itself on, on my mind. Why, he asked, have we not developed a mode of critical cultural consciousness which utilizes religion as its primary means of access? And why, when we have learned to do this, why do we restrict our focus of inquiry to the world of the past tense? Why are we not able to say more about the dynamics of contemporary cultural change? In that same piece, Walter wrote what felt to me at the time while I was sort of stumbling around figuring what I was about in graduate school, a declaration of intellectual independence that it was okay to follow my nose in the ways that I wanted to. And this is what Walter wrote, this, this same piece. My feeling is, he said, and I'm being self-critical, that we are still writing term papers to each other rather than thinking through the strategy by which religious studies might more regularly and substantially contribute to the welfare of our larger collective life. 
Is it any wonder that some of us who learned from Walter embraced a cultural analysis rooted in the sensibilities of religious studies, but taking as subject issues of current concern? And uh, I don't want to embarrass David too much because we've talked about this, this already. And I'm not saying this because we've been close now for, for 35 years. Uh, but it, it, I think it is the case that salvation and suicide was the earliest and one of the, the best, if not the best, way of saying, we can, we can do this. Uh, we can do it from the perspective of a historian of religion. We can enter imaginatively into these worlds and be critical. Uh, I mean, it was a majestic accomplishment. And what I most remember, we talked about this, Dee, you will remember this, that some of the reviews were very angry that David didn't come out and say at the end, and after all this, it was bad. Shame on them. That somehow even people, uh, sophisticated academics supposedly, uh, uh, didn't understand that, that uh, entering into an exquisitely uh, 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 talking about uh, uh, to an audience a worldview, inhabiting that worldview for readers was not the same as morally endorsing it. Uh, so, so that remains, uh, I think, to me, a, a very significant um, book to be followed, of course, by, by many others. Well, <clears throat> let's now return to our regularly scheduled program featuring Ed slithering around bikes, bedposts, large framed photographs, and various other impediments in the Caps garage in the quest for more materials. Roger, Roger Caps said two days in a row, he may have done this all, me knowing that he wanted to video me in various postures of <laughs> getting stuff out. Might have been interesting. Well, I want to spend my re remaining time letting Walter's voice speak mostly from the pages of his unfinished and untitled manuscript, uh, this one on religion and politics running for office. Before we do, however, there is exciting news, and that is that there were several chapters, as I said, that could not be recovered from this disc that Laura and Todd worked on. Uh, but I found two uh, physical chapters of this text. They're now scanned onto discs at Lois's office. There are physical copies of this now. Um, so I don't know if these are the only extant copies, but I'm going to choose to believe that they are so that I can claim uh, a preferred narrative of discovery, which is you know, it's really inspiring to, to think about. Well, uh, it, it's not fair, I don't think, to characterize this as a first draft. It feels to me that Walter was writing this for himself uh, before turning it into a first draft to be read by others. I hope and trust he would not mind my sharing some of it. The introduction on running for Congress is an extended commentary on the meaning and message of the 1994 election. It does not stand, he wrote, as the event which marks a decision by the citizenry to chart a new path. Rather, it symbolizes an explosion of collective emotion against prevailing government, no longer trusted or respected, and at times hardly even recognized. In chapter one, a candidate's perspective, Walter wrote about the activities that took him to Washington over many years. I spent so much time on Capitol Hill that I was able to schedule my haircuts in the Senate barbershop. <laughs> None of this, he says, led to the acquisition of Potomac fever, but I did come to recognize that much of our aspiration as a people cannot approximate full fruition unless it is validated by the legislative process. He first gave serious consideration to running after working with Senator Bob Kerry's campaign for president in 1992. And then, of course, came this period of deep struggle. I was forewarned that running for office is an identity-defining experience. Perhaps nothing you have ever encountered, he was told, will define you as deeply and as surely. Walter visited the offices of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the DCCC, and emerged quite discouraged. After all, what did I know about crime, the economy, immigration, and Governor Wilson? What I did know, and knew rather well, was how to create and teach college and university classes, 
stimulate intellectual interest in a topic, conduct research, and of course, think about beliefs and attitudes, individual aspiration, the spirit of our times, the desires of people all over the earth to live together in peace, the longings among the less fortunate for a life of realistic promise, and the desire of young people for an opportunity to live their ideals in a world that is given formation by hope rather than fear, and generosity rather than anger. Powerful words. And after such powerful words, it's time for a Walter story <clears throat> or two. In his memorial tribute to Walter, Congressman Fazio of California, chairman of the DCCC, when Walter was running, told his House colleagues <laughs> that the first communication he had had with Walter was uh, over the computer, via email, no doubt. He sent me a message from Santa Barbara, Fazio recalled. It said, you cannot imagine how entirely irrelevant the material you are sending me is. <laughs> It's words sound of familiar. It's one of the things he said about the first chapter of my dissertation or something. <laughs> was, did, did you get one? No. Anyway, this is, it's, it's really wonderful. <laughs> Why then did he run? The reason has more to do, he wrote, about seeing it as an assignment, an expansion of vocation, believing that I had something to contribute rather than the fulfillment of a life's ambition. It is no small thing to seek elected office. To be a representative of the people is to seek entry into important protected places of their lives, to ask them to attach their dreams and aspirations, and yes, their indignations, to the candidate's instrumentational abilities. Second Walter story. He recalls the burden during the campaign in 94 of being asked all the time how do we know you are not another Bill Clinton? And he writes, we tried for a bit of humor some of the time. You already know this, is, this just isn't going to work, is it? Uh, I'm not Bill Clinton. I play the tuba. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then he goes on to write as if he needs to, but the humorous response did not suffice. <laughs> I was surprised to read that his, and these are Walter's words, first take on the Republican contract with America was that in diagnostic terms, parts of it were rather good and some of it was very much on target. Some of the time, he wrote, I wished that those sponsoring me had worked out the tenets of their, our, political faith with comparable philosophical precision. Throughout the campaign, I was straining for the same objective myself. Well, in the interest of our time, I move past chapter two, constructing political reform, and chapter three, Gingrich and the Christian Coalition, to the last chapter that we have. And I have no idea if Walter saw this as the final chapter. Uh, cl clearly, this is all, at least it seems to me, pre-1996. And it would have been you know, fascinating to see where this would have gone post-1996, and had he worked on it for a really long time, post-2001. But this is the final chapter, Politics and Spirituality. The first section is entitled, Politics as Pilgrimage. <clears throat> Walter writes, I'm suggesting that the run for political office is like pilgrimage in a number of ways. It is directed movement. It requires total involvement. The movement and involvement create a strong sense of community in that one is accompanied on the journey by persons who are dedicated to the same cause and or to sustain the pilgrim. And the bonding is as strong as anything the participants had previously experienced. This is why campaign activists, when talking about their experiences, tend to highlight one campaign that was extraordinary for them. Wherever it happened, Whatever the political season, this was the normative pilgrimage, the one in which values and stamina were tested. And the recollection of who actually got the most votes sometimes occurs as an afterthought. And here I'm splicing together from different parts in this chapter. 
<clears throat> to realize that the race is over is to sense that life can begin to return to some sense of normalcy. It's a wonderful part of this chapter where Walter talks about uh, uh, after the, the last uh, speech on the campaign, Walter and Lois uh, and the, the family were driving home, singing songs, feeling incredibly liberated, almost like this ecstatic moment when, when they were returning, when they were returning to, to normal time. Walter writes, it's why those who devised the liturgical year made provision for the exciting, uplifting, exhilarating, high holy days, to be followed by days when the human spirit could simply take refuge in what is most appropriately called ordinary time. The degree of soul searching, he writes, that belongs to politics, particularly in the heat of the campaign, is not unlike that fostered in religion. The difference is that religion provides a standard or some authorized vectors in relation to, relationship to which the search is conducted, while the vectors that are most prominent in politics are the numbers that tell one how it appears that one is doing relative to one's opponent is doing. Walter's well-known dislike for fundraising is evident in the next section, politics as mendicant experience. <laughs> yep. In traditional religious terms, he writes, a mendicant is a person who renounces the ownership of personal property and sometimes in very austere fashion relies on the goodwill and charity of others. The politician, by comparison and contrast, it's a wonderfully cranky section, asks for money from virtually everyone with whom he or she comes in contact with, whether you know them or not. The support a monk seeks, however, is affirmation of the way he or she trusts the universe is ordered. That is, he or she, whoever rules this earth. I'm sorry, he or she lives by grace, the support of others, and the bounty of whoever rules this earth. In politics, the same transactions have become so completely tarnished that they become, they become bane rather than blessing, impediment rather than facilitator. The final sections of the chapter are progressive politics and progressive spirituality, contrasting the world of politics and academics, and the last part of the book, so far as we know, a section called The Teachings of Jesus. The last is a topic Walter wrote whose force has been growing in my reflections and which I suspect is more central to the subject of this chapter than I can fully appreciate. It was on a trip to Jerusalem with Lois, a life-affecting trip, he writes, when, and these are his words now, a completely unexpected fusion took place regarding the relationships between politics and the religious life. In a word, it was while we were there that I became aware of the political dimensions of the ministry of Jesus. It's about how Jesus of Nazareth lived his life and spent his time, traveling from town to town to talk with assembled groups about what was happening in their lives, in both individual and collective senses, and to offer words of encouragement. There were similarities, he thought, between this form of ministry and running for office. How did anyone know he would be coming? On what basis did he choose his topics? Did he give the same talk several times? Were his, audiences, were his audiences mostly pliant? Or did some give him a difficult time? How did he make his voice heard? And I, I couldn't help it, I immediately went to Monty Python and went, what, what did he say? Blessed, blessed are the cheese makers? I can't, I can't hear anything. Did he ever tire of the daily grind? How dependent was he upon his advisors? The only sin Jesus always condemned, Walter observed, was that of self-righteousness. He was a man of compassion who recognized children, gave validation to people of other races and cultures, and when the choice had to be made, put human factors above prescribed cultic practice or established legal obligation. He ends this part of the chapter by talking about more recent people of, of compassion, 
and clearly shares with them what he calls an ultimate vision. <clears throat> and this is what he says. The world is unitary, and our politics and our spirituality cannot forever be bifurcated, but are rather ingredients in the same whole. My own view, Walter said, is that reciprocity needs to rule, namely that spiritual vitality enjoins political culture. And political culture is complemented by recognition of the place and power of the transcendent. <clears throat> These materials, and so much more, will prove a challenge to whomever is brave enough to embark on an intellectual biography of Walter Capps. I was reminded, however, uh, of something that Michael Berenbaum said to me a number of years ago when I had just begun uh, my huntering and gathering over a period of many years at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum offices. Michael was the project director at the time. Um, and I, I had access to everybody and everything there. But he cautioned me on the way back from dinner one night. He said, he said Ed, you must remember that the whole story is not going to be found on paper. And clearly, the same thing uh, is, is true here. Because much of the story will be found in ongoing conversation with the many, many, many people whose lives touch Walter and whose lives Walter touched. Thank you very much. Um, I want to draw your attention to another religious figure that you may have forgotten, but I'll remind you of him. He used to appear occasionally on Saturday night uh, on television between 11 and 12.30. He always had a beautiful black cape with uh, the lining was uh, beautiful red, sharp red. Uh, he used to wear a hat and um, he introduced himself as uh, Father Guido Sarducci. You remember him? And one of the things that uh, Guido Sarducci, you know, he had that, can you find the Pope in the pizza? You remember that? I know that some of you may be too young to remember that, but um, one of the things that uh, Father Sarducci um, had in mind was what he called the five minute university. Remember that? The five minute university. He, he didn't understand why you should take four years to do your undergraduate work because he knew that three years out of your undergraduate work, you'd only remember a few things that you could re relay in five minutes. So why waste all the four years and spend all that money? Uh, he, I don't know if he, if he talked about graduate programs, but wouldn't that be great, like a three-minute PhD program with Guido Sarducci? But the reason I start here is that um, 20,000 students took um, the Vietnam course, 20,000. And um, you talk to them, you meet them, and this is what they say over and over again. It's just like Guido Sarducci. The only thing they remember about their education at UCSB is that course. It erased everything else. Um, now, as some of you know, I've been teaching it for 13 years since Walter um, decided to run a second time for Congress because the first time he ran for Congress he kept this entire teaching load. He taught the Vietnam course and then after it the Voices of the Stranger course that you, you know about and all the other things that he was doing. And he was the chair of the Department of Religious Studies at the same time. Um, and um, um, well, anyway, um, I did write a paper, um, but so I've been teaching it for 13 years, and you can't, in that class, you can't get further than the end of the first week before some student raises his hand and says, uh, you know, Professor Hecht, I don't know why this course is in religious studies. It's about the Vietnam War. Um, and um, so after I did the course a couple of times, I decided I would write a functionalist definition of religion 
and put it on the website. So if you look under rs155.org, you'll find this funky uh, definition, functionalist definition of what, how religion works. Um, the course was, I think, justly um, um, noted in many, many places. Um, but we cannot forget the other course that he taught, Voices of the Stranger, which actually was larger than the Vietnam course. Um, that course enrolled regularly 966 students that filled Campbell Hall, always. The Vietnam course had started smaller and then it got large and then it got smaller and then it got large and went through uh, periods, but the, Viet uh, the Voice of the Stranger course was always the same. And um, at one point, uh, when I was, the first year I was teaching it, I, I realized that my teaching load was such that I didn't know whether I could maintain the order of the course. Walter always taught 155 in the winter and in the spring, Voice of the Stranger. And um, about a month after he had gone off to Congress, I believe it was in February 1997, he called me uh, when he'd come back to the district and he said, uh, well, how are things going in that course? And I said, I guess all right, um, but I have a question. Uh, can I come over to the house and ask you about it? So I, he we went over and um, Walter loved to play basketball. Remember the basketball in the back? And uh, I don't remember if we played basketball before or after I asked him the question. But I said, Walter, do you think it would be all right if I sort of moved the Voice of the Stranger course from the spring to the um, fall? And maybe I could do the Vietnam course in the spring. And he looked at me, he just shook his head, and he said, you can't do that. And um, I looked at him and I said, why not? And his answer um, uh, is the following. The Vietnam course is always offered in the winter quarter, and for me, it is the crucifixion. And the Voices course in the spring quarter because it's the resurrection. So here is that deep imprint uh, of Walter's theological thinking on the way he went about thinking about curricular matters and the relationships between courses. Um, he would also offer another reason for why the course was in religious studies. And if you look at his original syllabuses, and I've kept this sentence or this idea, um, he would argue that the course explain, explores the production of American collective memory. And here I think um, Walter was prescient in anticipating the fragmentation of American memory in the late 20th century and also the rise of academic studies. I think Ed has uh, referred to this. Uh, the rise of memory studies um, in, uh, or the centrality of uh, memory in various kinds of cultural analyses. Um, in a few minutes uh, that I have um, for my presentation, I'd like to take up that student's question again and tell you why I think religious, um, the Vietnam course belongs in religious studies. And I don't think this is a big wisdom. I think this is pretty superficial, um, although I will mention Walter Benjamin and Michael Tauzig and some other folks along the way. Um, but um, over the course, that, over the time that I've taught the course, these 13 years, many of the same people who, those of you who were in the class and worked with Walter at earlier stages, will immediate, immediately recall. Um, but I mention them only because there are some here who never uh, saw these people. Um, I'm reminded of an individual who was horribly burned in a motorcycle accident, accident and then he decided with the money from the accident insurance, he would go to um, a small town in Colorado and uh, just to get away, I think. And um, he then read in the paper about a stove company in the um, um, northeast of, of the United States that was closing and about 40 workers would be put out of, uh, out of work. 
And so he took that money from the accident and he moved the whole stove company to this little town in Colorado. And then he became uh, the mayor of that little town. And he then decided that he would do something that he really wanted to do, which was to teach himself how to fly, or he'd take flying lessons. And in another horrible accident, um, they didn't de-ice the wings enough, and the plane crashed into the side of a mountain. And so this man would come into the Voice of the Stranger class, for example, in his wheelchair, and he'd tell the students, I guess the, the bottom line message was, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with it. Um, over and over again, we would hear these extraordinary stories of real courage, real heroism, uh, of people who confronted the most extraordinary circumstances and somehow overcame them. Um, a 70-year-old woman, for, for example, um, who told the class of her escape from certain death in the Nazi concentration camp of Stutthof as her mother pushed, pushed her and her sister out of the door and the door closed and everyone in that room died. Or um, a young man whose cere cerebral palsy is so severe that he is a ward of the state and comes into the class in a wheelchair to tell students that his only desire is to live independently like them and to marry the woman he is in love with who's there in the class in a wheelchair also. Um, and which the state of California will not allow because the state believes that neither can live independently. Uh, Walter learned early, I think, that these narratives of resistance, of courage, had a deep resonance with the students precisely because they too were in struggles to overcome fear and adversity, certainly not as severe or extreme in some cases as the individuals that came into this course, but nevertheless narratives which gave them hope that they could realize their own hopes, their own desires, their own dreams, and that they should not compromise for anything else. But there are other elements in these narratives which I believe locate them clearly in the study of religion. No other discipline uh, in the university can take up the meaning of these narratives. As you know, each class session involved a veteran or some other person with direct experience of the Vietnam War or now our most recent conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq narrating their experiences of combat. There is a nucleus of six to eight individuals who have annually participated in the course over a very long period of time, 29 years. I can't even afford to pay their parking permits. And they're there all the time. Um, one veteran, John Muir, took the course when he was a reentry student in 1981. And he completed his undergraduate degree and then went on to a master's degree in education and now teaches in one of the local high schools. When Muir was completing his master's degree, he helped Walter by holding informal discussions for the students. And when he comes into the class, Muir narrates his experience through his poetry, which he tells students was one of the most important ways that he came to terms with the trauma of com combat. Let me just quote one of his poems, a few lines from it. The poem is called Bouncing Betty, and it is a poem about an American-made mine, the kind that, quote, blow up people and kids and water buffaloes and puppies and anything at all that will step on her. Betty's a very special mind indeed. She's not content just to kill or maim you, She's not happy unless she scares the shit out of you. Betty's made to pop out of the, uh, up out of the ground, just at the level of a growing boy's testicles, and then blow up. And lest you think I'm making this up, her primary component is the explosive head of a 60 millimeter mortar shell spring launched from a buried tube and timed to explode in a flat disc pattern approximately three feet in the air, crotch high, 
and we invented her. By we, I mean America. Over the years, the speakers have included um, Air Force pilots shot down um, um, by SAM missiles and who spent long years in the Hanoi Hilton, other veterans um, who were wounded multiple times, um, and most recently, um, uh, in, an individual who joined the Marine Corps in 1965 and was trained as a sniper who tells the students how mistakenly he killed three people at close range, two of them women and one a child. That man was shattered by that experience in 1967 and he spent all these years trying to overcome the trauma. And what did it? The class. When he came into the class and he, uh, for the first two years, uh, he just sat silently, didn't say a word to anyone uh, about what he had experienced. Um, the nucleus of the narrators are all men who have suffered extensive post-traumatic stress disorder for decades and have worked for many years with a brilliant psychologist in the, Santa Bar in the Santa Barbara area who is part of the outreach efforts of the Los Angeles Veterans Center. As these individuals have presented the narrative of their experiences in Vietnam, there is a common pattern. There is a frame narrative which remains stable and relatively unchanging from year to year. I am intentionally here trying to read these narratives as a text, precisely in the way that Walter Benjamin understood text in his famous essay on Marcel Proust. But on each telling, the narrative becomes more and more complex, more and more detailed, and more and more rich in terms of its psychological and introspective depth. I think very few people have been in that position that I have to see this unfold year after year after year. Ed came to the class many times, uh, others came many times, but to see it actually unfold is an extraordinary experience. Let me tell you about one individual uh, and his uh, narrative. His name is Wilson Hubble, and he assisted Walter in the class um, almost from the beginning. He's, he's been in the class as a, its assistant for 25 years, 25 years, and he hardly ever misses a class. So he tells us that um, it was normal in his family in San Diego when he was a child to know that all the men in his family had served in the military. It was a rite of passage, and he registered for the draft when he turned 18. On Christmas Eve, 1965, he received a registered letter which contained his draft induction letter signed by President Lyndon Johnson. The war in Vietnam was heating up and he knew that if you got drafted, you got a dangerous assignment. There was a waiting list for the National Guard and for the Army Reserves. Both the Navy and the Air Force had four-year commitments and the Marines were out of the question for him. He knew, however, that if he enlisted for an additional year of service, not the two years of draft induction service, but usually a three-year enlistment, he could choose what he might end up with. So he went to the Army recruiting office, where the recruiting sergeant showed him a huge book uh, of all the various jobs and duties the Army would train him for beyond being an infantry soldier. Each page had a colorful photograph of the job you could be trained for, and Wilson leafed through the pages until he came to a photo of a soldier in the doorway of a CH-47 helicopter aiming a 50 caliber machine gun. And Wilson pointed to this and said to the sergeant, what about this? Can I be trained for this? Uh, what is it that it says here, uh, helicopter crew chief? The sergeant looked at him and answered, we have openings. Of course, Wilson went through basic training. He was assigned to the 196th Army Helicopter Support Company. And the frame narrative is a series of elements of his 
life, his experience in Vietnam. Um, one of the most important uh, experience that he narrates is a friendship that developed with a man by the name of Keith Wrights, who was a young army enlistee like Wilson, who came from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, who served, uh, who shared his tent in Quignan, where each night they would talk about what body part they would give up for the things from back home, back in the world. Quote, I would give my right testicle for a pizza right now, end quote. Um, in 1970, the Army was offering bonuses of, of $10,000 if you re-enlisted after your first tour of duty. This was a huge amount of money for the young man from Idaho. Reitz re-enlisted, and after a short leave where he, can't, he returned to Coeur d'Alene, um, he returned to Vietnam in January and then was killed in action in March 2007. Wilson's return to the U.S. at night was always marked by what he called the inconvenience, returning at night, so that these veterans would not inconvenience the traveling public. Wilson, like so many others, took off his uniform, put it in the back of his closet, and as he tells us, hid out. Reitz's death was traumatic, but it happened after Wilson returned to the U.S. Um, he regularly has gone to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial with the class, with Walter, and then with myself. And he always, when we get to the me memorial, goes first to the name of Keith Reitz. Um, he also has visited Keith Reitz's family in Coeur d'Alene. But there is something even more traumatic, which was part of his Vietnam experience. There was a solemn commitment that all helicopter crew members and pilots uh, acknowledged. Quote, you never fly away from your buddies who have been shot down. And if you are shot down, there will be others who will come after you. During the Tet Offensive in February 1968, Wilson and his helicopter were flying a resupply mission to an advanced fire base near the Cambodian border. On one of their missions, they had landed and the crew and the soldiers at the base were unloading the cargo when there was a North Vietnamese artillery attack. One of the shells struck the base's munitions area, setting off explosion after explosion. The pilot of Wilson's uh, helicopter gave the order to start the takeoff procedure and as the crew went through the long protocol to take off, the explosions became more and more threatening. Finally, the rotors began to turn, and the helicopter slowly lifted off the ground and gained al altitude. Wilson looked down from his window in the back of the helicopter, and he saw directly below him three soldiers who were trapped between the base's perimeter wire and the exploding ammunition dump. They were helpless, and they looked up at Wilson and his helicopter. He could see their faces, and he said, we flew away. We left them to die. That was the traumatic moment of Wilson's experience in Vietnam. Of course, um, he also went back to Vietnam in the mid-1990s on a cycle Vietnam trip. And he narrates that to the students. Um, and it's really an extraordinary event because the first time he went to um, Vietnam, the first night he is visited by all of the people who he knew and who died in Vietnam. And finally, the last of them is Keith Wrights, um, who appears and screams at him, what the fuck are you doing here? Go home. Well, Wilson went home, but he came back the next year, and he cycled from Hanoi to Saigon. All kinds of wonderful things happened to him. For example, at one point, um, they, the cyclers got near Quinh Yan, where he had been stationed, and there was a beautiful beach there, and he went to the beach, looked at the sand dunes, and was admiring the water, and he noticed a young Vietnamese man who came up to him wearing bathing trunks. 
Wilson tried to speak to him in what he remembered of his broken Vietnamese, Mung Thai, American, American. He pointed back to the area of Quyn Yan. I was in army over, over there. I am from California, Santa Barbara, California. The young Vietnamese man smirked at him and in perfect English said, no shit. <laughs> like I was so dumb. I'm Fred from Orange County. <laughs> and I'm here visiting my relatives. Now what is interesting is that this frame narrative, I've heard it 13 times. But every time he tells it, it's different. And this most recent um, offering the course, he did something which was extraordinary. He finally understood that moment when he looked down out of the window and saw those three soldiers trapped between the uh, perimeter wire of the camp and that exploding ammunition. In the last two years, he has struck up a conversation via email with another pilot of a helicopter. And gradually, as they communicated with one another, they realized that they were in Vietnam at the exact same time. They were both in the same uh, air base. And that pilot who was communicating with Wilson um, was there that day that Wilson saw those men trapped. And he told Wilson that in his helicopter, he had the commanding officer of the base who ordered all the helicopters away. It was not cowardice. It was not fear. It was an order that took those helicopters away from those men. That's an example of a kind of interpretation that is always going on in these narratives. So I'm sitting there and I'm trying to understand these frame narratives. All the elements are repeated each year, but each time there is something new that has not been in the narrative before. Here it is not a matter of emphasis, but of whole new elements of experience. I return to Benjamin's uh, essay on the image of Proust, which perhaps will help us to understand, of course, the constant re reweaving that goes on in narrative. Benjamin recalled Penelope's working, work of weaving and unweaving and linked that to, of course, Proust's memoir involuntaire. He wrote, closer to forgetting than what is usually called memory, he reminded his reader, the Latin word textum means web. No one's text is more of a web or more tightly woven than that of Marcel Proust. Benjamin continued to him, nothing was tight or durable enough. For his publisher, Gallimar, we know that Proust's proofreading habits were the despair of the typesetters. The galleys always came back covered with writing to the edge of the page, but not a single misprint had been corrected. All available space had been used for fresh text. Thus, the laws of remembrance, Benjamin writes, were operative even within the confines of the work, for an experienced event is finite at any rate, confined to one sphere of experience. A remembered event is infinite because it is merely a key to everything that happened before it and after it. So I think that notion of the text and the involuntary memory at one level helps to explain what I have been seeing for these 13 years in these narratives. Let me go back to that question about why this course, and I'm going to do this very, very quickly, why the course is religious studies. Recently, like Ed, who's doing this archaeology, I turned I opened up a book of my notes, and I have it with me if anyone dares to say that this is incorrect. And there are some notes there which I found quite startling. 
Um, I found notes on a lecture presented by, Bar by Barbara Meyerhoff entitled Myths of the Self, Storytelling and Narration Among er Elderly Jews, which she gave on December 13, 1979, in the Robert M. Hutchins Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, which Walter had been instrumental in moving to the campus after the death of Hutchins, and which he directed, I believe, for three years. Of course, Meyerhoff had published that extraordinary Number Our Days in 1978, and which remains one of the seminal works of American Jewish ethnography. In that book and in her talk at the Hutchins Center, Meyerhoff had discussed her use of the term homo nerons, maybe something like narrating human or something. And she talked about what is storytelling about? It's really to preserve the identity, to mark the place of an individual, so as not to dissolve into nothingness. It's almost a direct quote from her. Um, she tried to understand storytelling as a living midrash. Um, and she drew a number of parallels um, in her uh, presentation. Almost all of the elderly Jews she worked with were the survivors of the Holocaust, and their stories were told against the facticity of that event. The stories she had heard and documented were set against that trauma and were intended to relocate these Jews in time and space and to mark their presence. For me, Meyerhoff's presentation at Walters Hutchins Center begins to close the circle for my question of why in religious studies. She presented this lecture only a few months after Walter had taught the course on Vietnam for the first time, and just a few weeks before he would teach it again. And therefore, that notion of memory, I think, was with Walter. Um, and he took that into the classroom. Um, these narratives that he heard and that these 20,000 students have been privileged to listen to were really about marking an identity, marking a place, so that these individuals would not dissolve into the past. Now, there are other ways to uh, describe this, and I'll just mention them very quickly. The third section of this little paper is entitled The Persistence of Myth in Contemporary America, and that already points to why these things are important, namely, Walter understood them to be the presence of myth in contemporary religious life. So the way I get to that is to go back to Walter Benjamin and to two of his works, um, one of which is The Storyteller, which he wrote in 1936. Um, and it's from the same year that he wrote the more famous, The Work of Art in the Age of Its Technological Reproducibility. Um, but he asked what storytelling is. And in that essay, he argued um, that there is a kind of simultaneity that goes on in storytelling, in which the individual who listens is linked to the individual who tells. And I think Walter understood that as one of the powers of these narratives that the students listen to. Secondly, we might take um, uh, account of one of Benjamin's most brilliant interpreters uh, uh, today, namely uh, Michael Tausig. And Michael Tausig is a storyteller. Some of the stories are short chapters. Other are books like Law in a Lawless Land or My Cocaine Museum. Um, but he has made storytelling and the story into an analytical object as well. What Tausig suggests is that there's something compelling about the revelation of secrecy in a story. Third, and perhaps most importantly, and I'll stop with this, is that Walter understood the tellings that are the center of the Vietnam course to contain the presence of myth or to reflect the powers of myth in our own contemporary world. Essentially, myth is fundamental to all of these tellings. For many of the veterans, they came of age in Vietnam, but they were born or were created 
in Vietnam. Almost every narrative begins with brief details about their lives before their Vietnam experience. And these details are given um, in the most brief fashion, almost as facts that set the veteran in a specific time and place. Here I think we see the faint tracings, or perhaps the faint echoes, of something that we would know in other contexts as creation myths, and more specifically, the myths of creation through conflict, through battle, or even sacrifice. Much like the uses of myth in traditional societies, the individual goes back to the moment of creation to be recreated again. And I think that is precisely the central dynamic of Wilson's narrative, as well as every other narrative that I have heard in these past 13 years. In each narrative, the speaker, the Benjaminian storyteller, goes back to the central trauma which created them and determined their destiny for all the years after it, um, that structured their life and all of their relationships around them. Walter clearly understood then that the power of these narratives was the same consistent power that drives all religious traditions. And I think, therefore, he concluded it must be in religious studies. Thank you. <laughs>